Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining me again for another one of my Mindset Mondays. I just realized I forgot to turn my lighting on. So this is not going to be video with the best lighting, but that's okay. You guys probably most of the time don't even watch and just more listen if you're anything like me. But thank you so much for taking the time to join me. If you're new to uh, my channel and whether you're on my YouTube channel or you're on Facebook, my name is Evelyn Knight. I am the Child Care Business Coach. The, I'm the founder and uh, CEO of Child Care Business Professionals, which is a company that helps child care Owners and directors learn how to manage child care center effectively, efficiently, and profitably while really prioritizing quality for the children. I'm also the host of the Child Care Business Coach podcast, and I am uh, a child care center owner. That is really what sets me out. No, I've noticed lately there are a lot of child care business coaches out there right now, but what makes me different is that I own a center too. I'm not a past owner. Well, I am a past owner, but I'm also a current owner. I've owned several centers. I've opened them. Um, I've actually started them from the ground up, built one. I've taken them over. I've reopened centers that are closed. I've even been an in-home provider. So I have a lot of experience in the field. So welcome and thank you. Uh, let me say hello as you jump on. Good morning. Uh, say hello as you guys jump on and um, I will love to see the interaction. I know how valuable time is. To me, time is the most valuable asset. So I like to know that my time is also being well used by creating these videos for you guys. Uh, so I'll let you guys say hello to my Mira today. She's joining me today. She had to, I couldn't keep her in. Hello, Sheila. Hi, Tiffany. So she's actually here with me today, helping me out, giving me some encouragement. So get to say hello to my Mira. Um, she's got quite the story. Mira is my standard rescue poodle who was uh, being mistreated and actually had stopped getting fed. She should be a full-size standard poodle, but because she was um, being severely neglected, she actually stopped growing at five months old. And when I took her to the vet, they tried everything to get her to start growing again. She never started again. So she's actually a small standard poodle. But enough for my poodle. Let's talk today about just um, a little bit about people pleasing and also about just being controlling, right? So often we try to control the people in our lives. We get upset with our staff our husbands, our own children, just in life in general, we tend to try to really control people. And it drives us crazy. A lot of times the issues that we're having with our staffs in our child care programs are happening because we're trying to control them. Instead of leading and coaching, we're trying to change them. And we're trying to make them into somebody or something they are not, right? And so we end up becoming frustrated because instead of embracing them for who they are, we're always trying to change who they are. And that doesn't work. People are who they are and we cannot change them, right? So for example, let's say um, you're really frustrated with a staff member because of every week you go in at lunchtime. And I'm going to make up a ridiculous example of this. Okay, you guys, just to really solidify my point. And then I think I'll give you guys an example from marriage because we can all, or, or as a parent, because we can all relate to this as well. But first example is, let's say at lunchtime. Uh, well, I'm going to tell you guys one of my pet peeves, actually. The children always come first, right? Absolutely always come first. And I go into a classroom and I see that um, it's nap time, lunch, and the teachers are really obsessing over cleaning up the room after lunchtime while there's children crying and they're not attending to the children's needs. Instead, they're more concerned about how clean the room is, Mira. And so that's basically, if you think about that, I walk in and I say, hey, you know, attend to the children, attend to the children. And I'm just constantly getting frustrated with them because I'm seeing the same thing. 
I need to understand and realize that the way they operate and think is just different from me, right? So instead of coming from a place of judgment and trying to change who they are, I need to come from a place of training and coaching and explain why is it that we need to always identify the needs of the children. The reason I chose the subject of lunchtime is because I want you guys to picture your classrooms during lunchtime. During lunchtime, there's probably a lot of food on the floor, right? It is probably a mess. I mean, if you've ever cleaned up a two or three year old classroom after lunchtime, you know, there is food everywhere, right? So to a teacher, is their perspective particularly wrong? when they look at the food that's on the floor, the mess that's everywhere and think, I need to deal with that first, right? Then I come in and I hear the crying children like, no, 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 that um, corn dog remnant that's on the floor, that can wait, but that child who's crying, they need to be prioritized. So in this situation, how do you really determine which is right and wrong, right? How do I really know that I'm always right in this situation? I mean, leaving discarded corn dogs is not a good thing either. Or leaving spilt milk on the ground. What if one of the other children goes and picks it up and tries to eat it, right? So there's a lot more to think about. It's not always as cut and dry. But we tend to want to control people. And we want to walk into the room. And I've been guilty of this and just said, hey, there's children crying. What are you doing? You need to go deal with the children instead of, doing what you're doing. But when you really step back as a leader and ask yourself, who is really right and wrong and why is it? And I really stop to analyze that specific situation. You can really analyze that and figure out, okay, there is a method that does need to be prioritized here, right? And you can even come up with a compromise, like maybe get all the biggest chunks of food off the ground first and then dealing with the crying children. But for me, my philosophy is always the children come first in my, my vision. My philosophy is that the love and nurturing of children are my number one priority, right? So if we are going to stay true to my child care center's brand and who we are, the cries of a child will always, always come before spilt milk on the ground, right? But if my, my staff does not have a very thorough knowledge of our philosophy, our vision, and our priorities, they're not going to understand that. And they are very justified and thinking, I need to clean up the green beans that are on the floor that are left over from lunch, right? So it's very important for us to keep those kind of things in perspective. We need to understand and know that we, first of all, are always right. And secondly, we just need to help our staff understand why. If we are right, right, and I could have been wrong in that situation, but when I step back and analyze, if we are right, then how do we help our staff to understand that, right? Instead of coming in and just barking orders and expecting them and then getting frustrated. So I want you guys to look at this scenario from a different perspective. Okay. What I typically see in early childhood education is the director is going to walk in the room and she's going to, why are these children crying? Why every day I have to come in here and I have to talk to you about this. Yesterday it was the same thing. And then the teacher probably won't say anything. Right. And they probably will just automatically go and deal with the kids. But what did you really accomplish there? What kind of relationship did you build with your teacher? What did you really, did you really fix a problem? Right? So let's see, we have a, a comment, but they will walk uh, on the food and take it throughout your school, clean through the eating time. So, okay. So that's a good perspective. Now in my classrooms, they're set up that that's not going to happen because where they eat is going to be away from where they're walking around. But that you've got a very good point, right? That's a great argument that could make my philosophy wrong. So they're really, that's where we as leaders need to understand and know we don't always have the right answer. Oh, right. And so a great, another example to help you keep this into perspective where sometimes we're wrong. Uh, since we do help foster children, we work with a lot of foster children, we help uh, special needs children. One of the things that have happened in the past is we had a child who uh, had learned 
that they have to scavenge for food. Their family wasn't feeding them regularly. So this child had learned to be, to literally scavenge. They went through the trash. They went, ate what's off the floor. Any food that dropped, they would dive for, right? So this, when you have a child in that type of a situation in your care, and they're always trained mentally that if food falls on the floor, I got to eat it. And then they also know that there's scarcity. So they tend to hide and, and store the food, right? In that situation, even though our lunch tables aren't in tri high traffic areas, we still have to prioritize cleaning because we know that child is going to see the food hit the floor and they're going to go running for it, right? And yes, I know that's absolutely heartbreaking, but it is a true story we've dealt with. We deal with things like that a lot when you work with um, just high level foster children who've been neglected pretty badly. So when you keep that into perspective, sometimes our rules need to deviate. But if you're always so domineering and controlling, people are going to be afraid and they're just going to do what you say, not because out of respect for you, not because they're doing the right thing. They're doing it because they're afraid of you. And that is not what you want. You want a mutual respect, right? So you need to really sometimes take your eyes off the person and just look at the situation. You might have certain staff members that your personalities, your temperaments really just clash. You guys just really butt heads, right? And so what ends up happening is all the interactions with this person become like nails on a chalkboard. They just eat at you and eat at you and eat at you. But what we need to understand is that it's not always them. Sometimes it's us and our personality differences, right? So in situations like this, that's where you need to take your eyes off the people involved and just look at the situation, right? Again, my lunch example, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe my perspective is wrong. And like the comment, and I'm sorry, it just tells me Facebook user. It doesn't tell me who you are. I'll show you guys what it looks like. If you don't give StreamYard permission, this is what it looks like. Uh, but they will track throughout your school. Yeah, some classrooms may be set up that way, where if you don't clean it up, they're going to walk on the food and they're going to track it. Maybe the classrooms, um, some very high quality classrooms have tables spread out through every part of the classroom and the children are actually eating all over the place, right? So in that situation, absolutely. What works at my center isn't going to work at yours. That's why we need to understand that sometimes when we come in with these attitudes, we have the attitude and we are not always right as leaders. And that's where you have, and a lot of times we're doing this because of the people, right? We're like every single day I go through this with you and we're not looking at the situation. So just know people have different perspectives. We cannot change who they are at the core, but we can help them to understand why we need them to do what we do. Isn't that how we train two-year-olds? I mean, if you really, if you have a high quality program, you understand and know that discipline doesn't work. Things like timeout, they're not effective. They don't work, right? But you understand and know that teaching children appropriate behavior and coming from a place of guidance is what works, right? Same thing goes for your teachers. They are human. We are dealing in the world of humans, right? So the two-year-olds to the 30-year-olds that we're working with, same way our brain functions. Teaching instead of coming from a place of harshness is the way we're always going to work. Um, we can change how we see things and we can change how we act towards people, our reactions, but we cannot really change them. We can help them to grow, but you can't change somebody internally, right? So I want you to think about those characters and values. And that's one of the things, if you guys watch me if you uh, a lot, if you watch my recruiting boot camp, if you're one of my members and you watch all the information I have on hiring, it, I will tell you all the time, character and values. That is why you need to really hire based on character and values because you cannot change who someone is in their heart. You can't change who they've been wired to be in their mind, right? But you can help enhance 
the skills that they have. You can help them see the world in a different way. You can help open their eyes to a different way of thinking, but you can't change them. You can change you though, and you can help manage your stress level and how you come at things a lot more when you understand and you take away that emotional, personal part of things and just look at the situation, right? Um, one of the things my center has been dealing with a lot of is uh, I've noticed is just I'm managing right now. I am training my own directors. I'm getting ready to open a couple new programs. And so a few of my staff members are going through training to become my next directors. So I'm actively uh, doing a training with them right now, which by the way, if you're one of my members, you can be a part of this training every Thursday. I record it and you can be in the room with me virtually as I train my own staff. And one of the things I've come to realize through this process is we allow so many everyday things really eat at us and really, really get to us. And I came to realize that we can't change human nature, our clientele, staffing, the day-to-day -day problems that we will always, always deal with. But we can change our perspective, our reaction, and our emotions towards them, right? Owners and directors, we will always, absolutely always, have those tough families that are hard to deal with. We're always going to have that parent that we can't make happy. We're always going to have that staff member that is just pushing our buttons. And if you ever notice that staff member changes, your favorite staff member today, a year from now, may become that problem child. And then they'll go back to your favorite staff member, right? We're human. Life seasons take us in different places and put us in different positions. We live in the land of humans. That doesn't change but how we react and who we approach the situations as is 100% under our control. We do have control of that. So we need to choose what we're going to really allow to get to us emotionally, right? You can choose this week as you start your week and you deal with the everyday same old, same old problems are you really going to let those eat you alive? You choose that. I'm going to tell you right here and now, when you're dealing with that parent who's livid because of something that's totally out of your control, they honestly should have a nanny, right? Instead of having their children in a childcare program, you're always going to have that parent. 15 years ago, when I was running a program, I still had those parents. It doesn't change. It's the nature of the business you're always going to have those struggles, right? But how you approach them and how you see them is really going to be the game changer. Are you really going to let them get to you? Are you going to internalize it? Or are you going to deal with the situation at hand and then move on? Because we absolutely have to deal with the situation. We cannot avoid them. We have to deal with the situation at hand. But as soon as it's done, move on. Don't internalize it. Don't take it personally. It's not personal, right? We make so much of this world personal that really isn't. It's really more about them than it is about you, whether it's your staff or whether it's that client that is just driving you crazy right now. It's not you, it's them. But unfortunately, we make so much about us and we internalize and take so much responsibility that we cause ourselves so much undue stress that is not necessary. So just remind yourself when you're dealing with that parent this week, because we all will, right? Just remind yourself that there's always going to be this family. There's always going to be this teacher. It's just another day and it's just part of the job. It really is. And there's nothing wrong with that. If that is really, really hard for you to deal with, then maybe you're not cut out for leadership. It's something to really, and there's nothing wrong with that either, you guys. Let me tell you, there was a moment in my career 
where I realized I missed being a teacher in a classroom so much because that is what I loved. And that was what my passion was. And so many directors, especially I see they take these promotions because they were amazingly wonderful teachers, right? They were awesome teachers. And so they level up and become directors and sometimes even owners and you leave what you loved behind. And let me know if that resonates with you because I know so many of you feel that way where you honestly hate your job right now. You may hate being an owner. You may hate being a director. And sometimes that's because you left the part of the job that you loved when you were a teacher and you didn't realize that becoming an owner and director doesn't make it more, right? I think we all go into it thinking, I'm going to be so much more of this. But instead, what happens is you get less of what you loved. So that is your choice, though. And you cannot take that out on the parents and the teachers that you're managing. Because managing people, and managing a center isn't easy. And you're dealing in the land of humans. And you are going to deal with redundant problems. Yes, you're going to deal with that parent who doesn't have a clue about potty training. And two years later, you're going to have another parent that doesn't have a clue about potty training. That's just part of the game, right? It's part of being an owner or a director. So let me see. I have a staff member that can multitask. She focuses on thing, uh, one thing. Yes. When I uh, employ a new member, I let them know that accept her as she absolutely let her. I'm going to actually put this on here so you guys can see. Uh, a staff member who doesn't know. Absolutely. Did you know? that multitasking is actually one of the worst things for time management you can do. We always look at multitasking as such an important trait to have, which it is. It is. But unfortunately, we as A-type leaders, a lot of times, we um, multitask way too much. And so we don't get things done. The other thing is we multitask to the point that we're doing a mediocre or a poor job of many things instead of a very good job of one thing. So people who don't multitask often produce greater results and they have better time management. But we tend to have the societal view that they're not as good for some reason, which is actually counterintuitive if you look at the data and the studies. So uh, just keep that in mind. I mean, one of the things that I've really had to teach myself in order to really learn how to manage time is to stop multitasking. Just get one thing done at a time, right? Now, when you're dealing with children, that can be very difficult. That can be very difficult. If you're changing diapers, yeah, you still need to be monitoring the classroom, doing different things. But when it comes to curriculum and different things, sometimes not multitasking is actually better for time management. So just keep it's nice. I'm an owner and director and a cleaner and a teacher loving every moment. Yes. So when you get to be in the classroom, you do really love every moment, right? Um, uh, one of the things that I've done for myself when uh, I realized that I had disconnected from what I loved most and when whenever I struggled the most with not just my professional life. But when I struggle with my personal life as well, I will go and spend a couple hours in the classrooms. Uh, and one of the things I started doing last year was intentionally when I go to my center, I do create time to just walk through every one of my classrooms and be with the children. Um, I use, I've always done that. Like I've always scheduled myself whenever I go to my center, I always walk through the classroom, say hello to the teachers, but before it was more for my staff's sake, before I wanted to be saying hello to my staff, working with my staff and really making sure I was keeping that rapport going with my staff. Right. Especially as I moved into just as an exclusive owner role and I'm no longer the director, I still wanted to have that connection with staff. So I basically intentionally um, was going in there for them, but I wasn't taking the time to play with the children and to be with the children. And when I realized that I was really losing sight of what I loved most and uh, my passion and what I loved about my work, I realized it's because I just need to go play with the kids. So I literally schedule a time in my day when I'm at my center to go play. I do. Uh, because that is the part of my program that I love and what keeps me going. And I know some of you might think that that's a huge waste of time, but it's not. It, it is probably one of the most important 
jobs that you can do as an owner or a director to keep perspective of what your teachers are dealing with and keeping your passion and love alive. If you're feeling that extreme burnout, right, where you just don't know if you want to do this anymore, that can be the key to changing it. Spend time with your children. Go in there and actually put it on your schedule every week. I don't care if it's 30 minutes. I don't care if it's 15 minutes. Go in and schedule time not to nitpick the classrooms, not to do observations, not to talk to your teachers, just to play with the children. And you will be amazed at how much burnout that alone can save you from. So I hope this was helpful for you guys, as always. Um, and I hope you guys um, have a great rest of your week. We have a lot coming for you guys. Last week, I talked to you about the uh, strategic planning uh, boot camp that we'll, we're going to be doing. Um, we have to change the date on that. We are not going to be doing it on February 11th. We had some stuff come up, so we're moving it to February 25th. The what that basically is, we're going to be, and we're opening this up to the public. It's not just going to be available to our members, but this is going to be a training course that we will be giving training hours uh, for states that we're certified in. But basically, it's going to just be helping you learn how to plan out your center. Uh, we're going to do it like an annual and a quarterly training on how do you do this. One of the things that my center does, I can tell you right now exactly what will be happening in my center in October of this year, right? We have everything dialed in. My teachers already know when they have to turn in their 4th of July curriculums, when they have to turn in anything they need, their supply list for the 4th of July. They have all of that done already. They know when all that is due. We dial this down to the point that they know what date our Christmas show has to be turned into us. Like what songs are their children singing? What are they performing? That's already out. My center already knows um, when that happens. And there's a reason for this. Um, it really, it avoids that scrambling. So for those of you guys, Mother's Day, Father's Day, all of that, Valentine's Day is coming up, right? For those of you, especially right now, this is a great example. Today is February 7th. If you don't already have all of the supplies done, I mean, your teachers should have already been working on their Valentine's Day gifts to their parents. All of that should have been done already, right? But I know some of you out there are scrambling. Like, oh my gosh, I've got to go get this. I got to go get the curriculum supplies. I got to do this. I got to do that. And they just planned last week. That causes so much undue stress and wastes so much of your time that you're, you're really just doing yourself a disservice and driving yourself crazy without having this type of strategic plan in place in your center. So if that is what you're dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis, if you know and you dread things like Mother's Day because it takes so long for the gifts to get out and all the, not all the children get them done, all of that, then you definitely needed to to create your year long plan. Yes, Courtney, you just created your year long reviewing. It was nice. That's awesome. This is something that we did with our clients. Uh, with my clients, we did a strategic planning. We showed them how we do it and we gave them um, the information for that. Courtney is one of our clients. So she got to do that with us. But basically i'm bringing that to the general public we will be actually teaching a seminar on that and we're going to really deep go really deeper so my members if you want to join this this is free to you my members this will be free to you but we're going to really dive deep into not only that annual plan but we're going to dive deep into how do you now create a quarterly plan and now we're going to create your monthly plan and then we're going to create your weekly plan. How do you really implement this? Get your teachers on board, get all of management on board to make sure that you really have a, a, a solid plan in place that will save you so much time and energy and it will stop you from chasing your teachers all the time, right? So join us for that. That's going to be on February 25th. Um, one of the things I do when we do these programs is I do create a about a, they're three to four hours long, right? This one, um, I, I'm finishing it up. It's going to be from probably 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. Pacific time. Yes, that's on the 25th. When I do trainings, I have a deep, you guys know my background's in psychology, and I have a deep understanding of knowing that very little training is actually ever implemented. But if you can combine training and coaching, suddenly things happen right? Which is why my membership program works the way it does. And I don't just train, I add coaching and accountability in, right? So 
when I do these trainings, the way they are structured is we're going to train for probably about anywhere from 45 minutes to an hour. Then we do the work together. That way I know you're really getting the work done, right? And you can ask questions. We can problem solve together. Then we train again for a little while. Then we're going to do the work. And that's basically whenever I do trainings, this is how we do it. That way, by the time the training is over, I know that you have something that you can take to your center Monday morning and implement immediately. Otherwise, I know what happens with trainings. We do these amazing trainings and we think this is going to be a game changer for my center. But then it gets filed into a drawer and a year later we find it and we look at it and like, I took this amazing training, but I never did anything with it. Gosh, I got to do this. And then I might leave it on my desk. But then again, it's going to get cleaned up and filed. Two years later, I pull it out and look at it. I'm like, gosh, I really never did anything with this. I'm never going to do it. And I toss it in the garbage, right? So that's the typical human reaction to training. We don't do anything. Only about 5% of people actually implement training. So uh, it's 9 a.m. my time. Yes, that's Pacific Standard Time. So like Los Angeles time. It'll be 9 a.m. Los Angeles time. And then so we will be putting uh, the link to sign up for that out pretty soon. Pretty shortly. My team is working on getting that together, but that'll be on February 25th for anybody who wants to um, whoever wants to do that. Let's see. Hi, everyone. Just went through our first quarter of our calendar last week and our staff planning meeting. Yes, they signed who would take charge of the main dates. Um, it's wonderful, isn't it? When you take charge of those dates and you, and I can tell you guys also, uh, when you do that, the, the planning, it empowers your staff because, and we're going to go into how we form committees at my center as well. We do voluntary committees. Every staff member is required to volunteer for one committee, but it's things like our Thanksgiving feast planning, our Fourth of July parade planning, our Christmas show planning. They have to be on these different committees, right? Every staff member has to pick at least one a year. That means that the director and the owner doesn't have to do all the work. And it also empowers your staff to know that we value their opinions. We value them as competent, smart people who can get this work done. When you do that, you would be amazed at how suddenly your staff really steps up. Otherwise, a lot of the problems that we cause our staff that makes us feel like they're incompetent is because of how we treat them. If we treat them like we don't trust them, then they're going to act like they're not trustworthy. But when we lift them up and tell them, I believe in you, people will rise to the occasion. They don't want to let you down, right? That being said, we also have to make sure they know to ask for help. But we'll go through all of that during our strategic planning um, session. So I hope everybody has a great week. I hope to see you guys in that strategic planning session. It is a game changer for you guys. It'll save you so much time, energy, and most of all, frustration. And it'll make your center just flow so much easier. Every year it gets better and better. So have a great week, everybody. I'll talk to you soon.